Uh, but let me read you a few verses to begin with. You can turn to Acts 17 and hold your finger there if you want. We'll be there in a little bit. But in Nehemiah 3.5, it says this, And next unto them repaired the Tekoite, uh, unto them the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles put not their necks to the work of their Lord. Then over in chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Then I consulted with myself, and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers, and said unto them, Ye exact usury, every one of his brother, and I set a great assembly against them. Then in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 17, he says, Moreover, in those days the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. We know that Sandal and Tobiah were the enemies of God's people. Nehemiah 13, 17, he writes, Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? So we have people here who are in the category of the nobility. Okay? They're people in powerful positions. People of wealth. People with authority. Sometimes, as in Europe, they were the original settlers in an area and had great claims of land. So then the people who came later uh, were allowed to rent as, you know, uh, serfs or whatever. They were allowed to be the peasants on the nobility's land because the nobility were there. They were the families who were there first. But in Israel, it wasn't that way. It just happened to be the the elders of the patriarchs of the families, the ones chosen to lead out of this tribe or that tribe, captains of thousands, captains of hundreds, and so forth. These were the, quote-unquote, the nobles. Now there are two types of nobility. Number one, there's nobility due to positions of power and prestige. Nobility based on position. But there's also nobility due to the character of a person. And those are noble people. Noble people are not always in noble positions. And people in noble positions are too often not noble people. Um, the assumption of nobility because of position and not looking at character to determine nobility, that's a great crime in our world today. Noble positions can produce people called nobles, but they cannot produce noble people. So I want to talk today about noble people. What does it mean to be noble and not just be nobility? In Acts 17, verse 1, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was the synagogue of the Jews. Um, now, I want to skip over Thessalonica right now. And I want to go down to verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who came thither, coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. These, the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. Okay? Now, we're talking about a noble people. The people in Berea, as a synagogue, as a people, the majority there, were more noble than the Jewish community in Thessalonica, we will find. Sometime in antiquity past, some Jewish families had settled in the city of Berea in Macedonia, about 50 miles southwest of Thessalonica. It lay at the foot of Mount Bermius, the eastern side of the Vermeo mountain range, north of Mount Olympus, on a tributary of the Halikman River. I know that means a lot to you. It was anciently a farming community surrounded by lush pastures and lots of mountain streams. Sound like a beautiful place. Right at the uh, eastern edge of the Vermeo Mountains. And I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of Mount Olympus, but it was south from there a little ways. The Jewish families were about a thousand miles as the crow flies from Jerusalem. Northwest of Jerusalem. I don't know how much contact they would have had. 
If you went straight from Jerusalem across the Mediterranean up to Macedonia, a thousand miles approximately, it'd be hard to say how much interaction they had or accountability they had with the Jews in Jerusalem or the temple or the priest or the Sanhedrin. But it had to have been limited. These people did not have the means of communication and travel that we have. They had at least one copy and probably more copies of the Scriptures. We know that by reading the, the Scripture there, that they searched the Scriptures daily. That Scriptures that they had were the Old Testament. They had a large enough Jewish community in the days of Paul to have built a synagogue. Something which Philippi, which is called the chief city of that part of Macedonia, a more eastern part of Macedonia, uh, did not have a synagogue, but Berea had a synagogue. Either the Jewish community in Berea was much bigger, or it was much more in tune with serving God than the ones in Philippi even. They lived at the same time and in the same country as the Thessalonian Jews. Yet they, on the whole, were different than the Thess Thessalonian Jewish community. We find that when Paul preached in Thessalonica, a majority of the synagogue was less noble than the majority of the synagogue in Berea who were said to be more noble. Now let's go back and read what happened in Thessalonica. In verse uh, 17 verse 1 now when they had passed through Ap Amphipolis and Apollonia they came to Thessalonica where was a synagogue of the Jews they also had a synagogue there and Paul as his manner was went in unto them he probably said the same basic things to the Thessalonians as he later said to the Bereans in their synagogue okay uh, and went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures in all fairness, they put up with him for three Sabbath days, okay? So there had to be some sort of reasonableness there. Opening and alleging. What was he opening and alleging? That Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. And this Jesus, which I preach unto you, is Christ. Now, Paul did not have any problem with the beliefs of these people, he just wanted to let them know that their Messiah had come, and he came in a manner in which they were not expecting him to come. He did not ascend from, uh, descend from heaven on a white horse and conquer the Romans and set up a kingdom in Jerusalem like they were thinking he would. He will do that, but that he first had to come and pay for their redemption, something that they assumed was taking place with the blood of bulls and goats. So, Paul is showing from the scriptures. He had quite a few scriptures, and he reasoned with them three separate Sabbath days, uh, showing them from the scriptures that Christ must needs have suffered, that Jesus wasn't originally uh, the first coming to come to conquer. He was coming first to suffer and to make, re make uh, a propitiation for sin. So, he opens, he, he, he's teaching that, he's showing them, he's bringing forth the scriptures. And verse 4, and some of them believed and consorted with Paul. So there were some people there who were noble. And si uh, with Paul and Silas, and of, of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. These were noble people. Okay? The thing was, in Berea, in Berea the whole community, on the whole, was more noble. Because look what happens here. But the Jews which believed not, which had to have been a majority to accomplish what they accomplished. If they had been a minority, this wouldn't have happened, okay? So the majority of the Jews in Thessalonica moved with envy. What did they envy? They were jealous for their ism. They were jealous for their previous conclusions. They were jealous for the way things had been and what they had believed. And they took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. Isn't this interesting? We're going to go out and hire, we're going to go out and round up some no accounts, some low down hounds of society. We're going to round them up so that we can defend our religious beliefs. And gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So because they could not, with their knowledge of Scripture, overcome the truths put forth and the force of reason that Paul taught because they could not uh, 
overcome it and they were unwilling to submit to it, they, they resort to base fellows, they resort to tumult, they resort to dishonesty, um, and when they had found them, they drew them, drew uh, Jason and certain of the brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These men have turned the world upside down. These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Turn whose world upside down? Obviously, the truth had turned their little world upside down, and this was how they were going to deal with it. They admitted that the force of the argument was on Paul's side. He's turned the world upside down with it. Okay? Uh, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar. They could care less about the decrees of Caesar. These were Jews living in Macedonia. The last thing they cared about was Caesar, okay? Um, and saying that there is another king, one Jesus. They knew that the Messiah that they were looking for would come as a king. The Messiah, the Messiah they were looking for would come to conquer the Romans. The Messiah they were looking for would come and be a king, conquer the Roman, and do contrary to the decrees of Caesar. So they're not being honest here. Okay? And they troubled the people and rulers of the city. That's what they wanted to do. Okay? They wanted to stir up problems. And so they got some, some thieves and liars and baser sort of people to present a false front and to slander these people as though they were trying to overthrow the Roman government, they were trying to undermine Caesar's authority, which is the very thing they were hoping their Messiah would come and do. But they just didn't want to accept this man's teaching. And they didn't have the scriptural knowledge to overcome it. Um, so in the, verse 10, the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night and debris. They were in real danger. So the majority of, of uh, Thessalonica were closed to new ideas that didn't fit their previous conclusions. The majority were not willing to search the scriptures daily with the possibility of seeing evidence that they were mistaken in their doctrine. They might run to the Bible to uh, get a crutch for what they had wanted to believe, but they're not going to study to see if these things are so. The majority were content with their religion and didn't want to be inconvenienced or disturbed. They didn't want their little world turned upside down. They admitted that was the problem. They considered the bearer of new ideas, a bearer of Scripture uh, that was superior to theirs, uh, a knowledge of Scripture, as an enemy that needed destroyed. They were willing to make use of base individuals to defend their religious beliefs. They were willing to lie about Paul's message. They were willing to lie about allegiance to Rome. When they could not overthrow Paul's scriptural knowledge, they began to slander, persecute, to be unjust, and to be dishonest with people in the community who would be disturbed by the narrative they were putting forth when they themselves knew this is this is a false front, but it's accomplishing what we want to accomplish. But when Paul came to Berea, instead of resting in we are Abraham's seed, uh, and you know this believing on Jesus requires the faith of Abraham, not just the name. But he went, when he went to Berea, he found a different people on the whole. The majority, in Paul's opinion, were willing to hear reason, admit the force of it, and to adjust their thinking to that which could be shown to align with the Scriptures better than what they had previously held. They felt no shame or embarrassment or jealousy or envy in this because this was always their position to be open to truth as presented from the Scripture. They had not, they had not solidified on a little Ismite model that they wanted to preserve. Their goal was to pursue God through His Scriptures, and so this was not a disruption. It didn't turn their world upside down. This was not the first time they searched the Scriptures. Okay? People who are willing to search the Scriptures have been searching the Scriptures. People willing to search the Scriptures to see if these things are so are knowledgeable of the Scriptures. I found that out in my experience. 
they assumed or thought they understood the scripture. They've been studying it, reading over it, discussing it in synagogue since they were kids, most likely. But they were still willing to consider a new idea if indeed it proved to be more consistent and true to the proper interpretation of the scriptures. Now, instead of just making a quick resort to their pet verses to calm their insecurity, they studied not just individually on their own with their own, you know, I'm going to study this all by myself. I'm not going to listen to any people. I'm just going to read the Bible. Well, then you're listening to a people. You're listening to yourself and your thoughts. No, they studied the Bible with Paul's guidance. They studied the Scripture with him there, discussing it with them for days, daily. And they were willing to fully understand Paul's position and see if indeed it was scripturally the position to take. They were lovers of truth, not lovers of their Ismite way. They were educated enough in the Word so that they were able to weigh the concepts and principles in a logical and accurate way, not run and hide and canned and oversimplified answers. They revered the Scriptures enough to build truth upon them alone, not on some early rabbi's opinion or a martyr's opinion or some long-held tradition. They were familiar enough with the Scriptures to be aware of the passages which brought questions and needed answers. Answers which came through Jesus Christ. Answers which were provided by their fulfillment in Christ. Jesus, when Jesus' life brought the Scriptures together, so passages that didn't seem to fit now fit perfectly. Matthew Henry said in his commentary, they, they, need, they neither prejudged the cause nor were moved with envy at the managers of it, as the Jews at Thessalonica were, but were generously, uh, but very generously gave both it and them a fair hearing without passion or partiality. The word noble uh, comes from a Greek word where we get the name Eugene. Okay, the name Eugene is based on the Greek word where we get the word noble. It means a, a uh, well-born, okay, uh, quality stock basically, but it's used more properly to talk about someone who is generous. The word generous comes from that, the same Eugenius or whatever, the same Greek word. Uh, generous comes from that, and it's talking about a person of noble character. Paul was a person of noble character. We talked about it in Sunday school. He was zealously pursuing what he thought was true, but when he was shown that his assumption and his interpretation were incorrect, he was willing to turn around and suffer for the other side, the side he had been persecuting. That was very humiliating. You know, if I've been debating all these years for some, you know, maybe for Calvinism, and then suddenly I realize I'm wrong, and I start debating for Arminianism or, or something else, you know, that, that's, a, that's a hard step to take. Because once you have set yourself for a cause to back up and say, oh, I guess I'm wrong, you are thought to be surrendering to your opponents. Oh, they got the, they, you know, they won. No, in reality, I won. Because I'm pursuing truth. The only reason I was debating this is because I'm pursuing truth. Therefore, it's no shame. But if I'm attached to this, I mean, you know, I'm Baptist born, Baptist bred, and when I'm dead, I'll be Baptist dead. I've heard people say that. Well, if that's your big baby right there, that's your honey, then when you realize it's wrong, you're going to have a big crow to swallow. There's a lot of crow to eat there. But if you're pursuing truth and you say, you know, I don't, it doesn't matter whether I'm a Baptist or Catholic or Mormon or Jehovah's Witness, I just want the truth. Well, then when you when you change your position to be, to find truth, you're still going the same direction. And that is largely the difference between the majority of the Thessalonian Jews and the Berean Jews. The Berean Jews had maintained their nobility by maintaining a pursuit of God a pursuit of truth, a pursuit of, of His Word, a pursuit of holiness, not the establishment and polishing of their ism. Not the beautifying and defending of their ism, of their way of doing things. Adam Clark says, 
It was a maxim among the Jews that, quote, none was of a noble spirit who did not employ himself in the study of the law. It appears that the Bereans were a better educated and more polished people than those at Thessalonica. Why? Because they had been more in tune with studying the law. Now, this shoots the Marcionite Anabaptists in the heart of their modern doctrine because, think with me, obviously, the more noble Jew would also be better studied and better attached to the Word of God than the others. Right? Obviously, the Jews, more willing to search the Scriptures, had been more in the habit of searching the Scriptures previously. Obviously, the Jews who studied the Scriptures daily on the pursuit of truth would not believe in Jesus easier if Jesus came correcting and changing God's Word. But, if, if they were the ones who studied the Scriptures daily in the pursuit of truth, they would be quicker to believe in Jesus when He was perfectly aligned with God's Word, the Old Testament Scriptures, which were the only Scriptures they had. The Old Testament Scriptures, the Law and the Prophets, were the only Scriptures the Bereans would have recognized. I have found in my personal life that people ignorant of the Bible strive to act as though they know it while they hide in the few familiar places they have heard misinterpreted ad nauseum by their ignorant leaders who are doing the same thing, hiding in the same familiar and safe places that they have, you know, ran around all these years and avoided the things that didn't seem to fit because they didn't want to find out why they didn't fit. I have found that they are not open to discuss the Scriptures very far because the Scriptures are largely an unexplored wilderness to them. Especially the Old Testament. Naturally, they want to make it irrelevant, largely because they're ignorant of it. They don't understand how it fits, so it must not fit, right? They're not open to the force of truth because they don't know the Scriptures well enough to recognize the force of truth. And that's a sad case. If the force of truth will inconvenience or disturb their life, then they are not interested. They've got their own truth. These people have lived their life resting on the interpretations of people they like and want to be right. They feel that if there are enough people who believe like them, they can't be too wrong. And surely God will understand if a large group of people held to the same error. So, the best thing to do is get rid of this troublemaker who insists on presenting as an interpretation of Scripture that is foreign to their safe haven. The Jews of Thessalonica had the same root problem as those Jewish nobles who would not help Nehemiah build the wall. It's the same root. Getting dirty to build a wall was thought to be beneath their dignity. And studying the scriptures to learn if possibly our previous understanding is wrong was also thought to be beneath their dignity. So it was all about dignity, right? It was all about their dignity. This was their church. This was their religion. This was their way of life. And this, this guy sharing something from the scriptures that was not a part of of our camp uh, it was not okay let's just get rid of this guy in Jeremiah 2.21 the Lord says this of Israel yet I had planted thee a noble vine holy a right seed how then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me he said this about a New Testament church unto the church of the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick 
out of his place, except thou repent. So we see that what happened to ancient Israel, what happened to the Jews in Paul's day in Thessalonica, what happened to the church at Ephesus are very closely linked. And I see it happening all over today. One Jewish community in Berea, probably there for many decades, okay? The, the little town of Berea, now called Verea, if you want to look it up and see where it's at, it's said to have about 30,000 inhabitants, but it's, it's spelled V-E-R-I-A, Verea, um, and uh, has, you know, depending on what language, uh, it's, it's spelled differently, but um, this little community had been there a long time. Some people say back as far as 1000 BC. Some people say 400 and something BC. But it had been there a long time. How long the Jews had been there is hard to say. But the Jews dispersed over the Roman Empire had been a long time there as well. So you've got a little farming community. you got a Jewish synagogue. How long had the synagogue been there? I don't know, but at some time in history, a group of Jewish families wanting to preserve the faith for the next generation. Hearts right with God. Okay, I understand uh, we, could, we could call them Christians because in a real sense they were no different than us. They just had the, the faith that was delivered to them from uh, the Law and the Prophets and Christ had not come yet. This was the faith looking forward to Christ. We have the faith looking back to Christ coming and looking to the heavenly priesthood. But it's all the same basic faith of Abraham looking for the redemption God has promised. It's all called the gospel. Mm -hmm. Okay? So you have some Jewish families living in uh, Berea there. And they worked hard and built them a synagogue. That took out of their time and money. They were not rich. But they built them a synagogue. And they worked hard to maintain their synagogue. And children grew up and got married and had children. And the original leaders grew old and passed off the scene, and new children were born and grew up, and you have a generational uh, transmission of a noble character. How is it? What did the Bereans do that the Thessalonians did not do? Why is it the Thessalonians failed in maintaining nobility, and the Bereans succeeded in maintaining nobility? Now, in Thessalonica, there was still a remnant of nobility. But on the whole, they had lost it. Okay? In Berea, on the whole, they had maintained it. Is that of interest to us? Is that important to us today? We are no different in our little community in North Missouri. We're building us a synagogue, a meeting house, same thing. Okay? Whether you call it the, the church uh, which comes from the, the uh, Anglo-Saxon Kirk. It's, a, it's an assembly. Ecclesia. Okay, call that assembly. There's the word synagogue and the word church mean basically the same thing. So we're building us a synagogue. We're building us a church. And we are a community of faith. We are believing the gospel. We have the faith of Abraham. We are, we are going to be here, Lord willing, and hopefully the Lord will come back soon. But if He doesn't, we will have generational hopeful transmission of nobility. Ephesus had been there possibly 30 years or so when they had left their first love. What was that? What is the first love? What was the first love in Thessalonica? What was the first love in Berea? What was the first love of every new community of faith? We want to be what God wants us to be. We are pursuing the truth. We are wanting to be faithful to the Scriptures. We want to have the faith once delivered to the saints. We want to be... Uh, uh, we want to have a candle, a light in God's lampstand. Okay? We want to be His special people. Well, how do you, how do you transition from that to a people who are religious and they'll even resort to getting base and, and uh, reprobate people to help them defend their faith, defend their beliefs by lying and cheating and stirring up a ruckus and misrepresenting. How does that happen? Berea had maintained a noble heart toward God, 
and maintained a noble attitude towards truth and learning, had transmitted this noble attitude from generation to generation. The people there that Paul said were more noble who searched the Scriptures, they were the sons. Maybe the grandsons, maybe the great-grandsons. I don't know how long they've been there. But they are probably the great-great-grandsons of the original men who established this community in Berea. Wow! That says something for those people. It wasn't first generation. It wasn't second generation. I guarantee you there were probably many generations in that community at Berea. And yet, they were still noble enough that when a man showed up after all these years, this guy was telling them things Grandpa didn't believe and Grandpa didn't know. Okay, all these years they had thought the Messiah was going to come this way and do this thing. This man shows up and he is telling them, reasoning with them from the Scriptures, that this Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified by the Romans outside of Jerusalem, rose from the dead, and He is the true Messiah, and He came to pay for our sins because the blood of bulls and goats can't. And He's telling these people this. They've never heard anything like this before. And their Messiah already came and left, but He's coming back again to rule and reign. Um, and that's why they said there's another king, one Jesus. Yeah, okay. But, but He's coming back to do what they originally believed He would do. And so this guy is telling them all this stuff. And he's showing them in the scriptures. And these people still had enough nobility to hear him out patiently, to listen to all of his reasons, to compare the scriptures, to search it out, and say, you know what? This guy's right. This is, real, this is going to turn our world upside down in some ways. This is totally different. This really changes things in our outlook, in our worldview, our understanding of our own Messiah. Do you realize what a depth of nobility it would require for the majority of a group to be willing to hear them out, reason with, they'd have to have some brains of their own. You know, I've, I've discussed doctrine with a lot of different people and I realized, after, after a little bit, I realized they don't know the Bible enough to have this discussion. They're not familiar enough with the Scriptures for us to even have a productive discussion like this. Uh, so, we're not going to go anywhere. Maybe that's what happened with the majority of Thessalonica. Obviously, you know, in, in Rome, Paul finally shook his lap and said, your blood be on your own head. Well, has Isaiah prophesied of you. These people draw near me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Their ears are closed. Their eyes are closed. Their hearts wax gross. They can't be led. They can't be taught. They're stuck in an ideology, and it's, it's, it's old, and it's moldy, and it's, it's uh, decayed. Why? Because there's not been fresh growth and study. They're stagnant. So we really got to hand it to these people. By maintaining this noble heart and mind toward truth, they had paved the way for the good news of Jesus Messiah to enrich their lives and save their souls. They didn't realize what they were doing. But by, by the whole group, on the whole, the majority of the group, raising up their young men and their young ladies, to get married and have children and raise up those children to get married and have children and maintain a noble heart towards God by working at this, by, uh, you know, they didn't have any worldwide evangelistic associations winning the world. They were kind of stuck in their community. You know, the cows, the goats, the chickens. This is a farming community. They were working. They were doing their chores. But religion did not become humdrum. Their faith did not become, oh, going to synagogue. It did not become mechanical. From generation to generation, they maintained a heart that was warm, a heart that was hot towards God. And what it did by maintaining that, when the truth arrived about the Messiah, instead of being cut off, they were saved. 
And that was the difference. That's big. A faithful, humble Jew was in the grace of God and was predisposed to believe in Jesus because of being in tune with God's law and the prophets. If a Jew rejected Christ, they would then be cut off from the salvation they had expected from Judaism. That's very clear in the Bible. In Thessalonica, they had prided themselves in their form and status. They presumed to be God's people without putting forth the humble effort to actually be such. They used their religion as an insurance policy while pursuing the things they really valued in life. Instead of predisposing their children to believe the gospel, they actually made them predisposed to reject God's Spirit when it called to them through the Apostle Paul. I hope you're listening this morning. We're going to either go one way or the other in our future generations. So how about us? And those listening in, I wish I had all, I wish I could preach this at an Anabaptist conference. Because the Anabaptist movement has derailed on this very point. I'll prove it in a minute. How much do you actually study the Scriptures and listen to what's said in here and make note of it in your mind? If you are not intelligently studying the Scriptures and knowing the Word of God, then when someone comes with a new concept, you're going to be afraid to discuss it. You're going to run in your rabbit hole of familiarity and avoid it. Now, I understand if you're young and you're not trained, what you need to do is bring that person to the authority. Bring that person to the elders. Paul wasn't discussing this with the children in the church. He was talking to the elders of the church. That was appropriate, and that's how they went about it. But someday you might be an elder in the church. There's a lot of elders in the Anabaptist movement who know way too little about the Anabaptist movement. When it started, how it really operated, what the points really were. There's a lot of people in the Anabaptist movement who are leaders who know very little, too little, about the Old Testament, about the gospel preached to Abraham, about the faith of Abraham, and consequently, the faith of Jesus Christ. Are you sufficiently educated in the Word of God to intelligently discuss it with someone who may present a challenge? Do you rest your doctrine on the Word of God alone or on some church writings or the bigness of your group or the success of your church ministries? Are your church leaders willing to fairly hear out the presentation of doctrine that may challenge your previous position without prejudice? Are your church leaders willing to study the Scriptures for days to determine if indeed this new idea is right or wrong? Are your church leaders willing to change, admit error, and embrace something different, even if it brings persecution, financial loss, and discomfort? What if, what if it splits the church? What if it does? What if truth splits your church? Obviously that split needed to happen. Right. Number seven, does your present church attitude predispose your youth to a humble willingness to search the Scriptures, or does your present church attitude predispose your youth to rest in canned answers, hide in familiar doctrine, rest upon uninspired writings and anecdotes passed around the church as proof of our position? Anecdotes. Those are quaint little stories to supposedly illustrate the truth of our doctrine. You don't build doctrine on that. Or does your present church attitude predispose your youth to prejudge issues before actually hearing them out and testing them with the Scriptures? You see, how our youth turn out is largely due to how we are and how we approach things like this. Let me read you something. I was in a, a prolonged debate with some Anabaptist peoples. And uh, how many of you know who Elmo Stoll is? You read his book. Okay, this was his son, Aaron Stoll. 
Very nice fella. I stayed in his home one night. Uh, him and his brother Solomon, very nice guys. Okay? And so we had a prolonged discussion. And I want you to read. This was towards the end. This was towards the end when all their presuppositions were crumbling before their eyes about the Scriptures. I want you to hear the sentiment in what you're going to read. And I want you to understand that this is the same issue that Ephesus fell into, that the Jews fell into, that the Thessalonians fell into. Quote, All of us involved would like to say that we are, above all else, seeking for truth, God's will for His people today. But how open are we to arguments that attack our fundamental perspective of the Gospel? In a recent newsletter of his, Bullen describes the many changes he has already made in his life. Now this was published in Plain Things magazine. I believe it was Plain Things magazine. Okay, which is an Anabaptist magazine. Okay, so this was nothing, this was not private correspondence. Okay, these people published it and signed their name to it. So, uh, I had made them a challenge and our debate, some of our debate was being published in this uh, paper as well. In a recent newsletter of his, which I have a copy of, Bullen describes the many changes he has already made in his life, leaving the Baptist for the Mennonites, but at the last minute, turning aside from the Mennonites to become who he is now, Bullen issues his version of the moral landscape challenge. And this is what I said, quote, they're quoting me here, I have a challenge for you, which in a real and most sobering way will help you determine whether you are a true disciple of Jesus or just an Ismite, like the scribes and Pharisees, who held their pet dogmas higher than the Scripture. We have recently published a book and mailed one to many of you called The Alien Exposed. Have you read it? I am offering $1,000 to any person who can disprove the book's message from the Scriptures. Why am I doing this? If I am wrong, I want to know why and where. I see a grave need in our day. People claiming to be disciples of Christ yet closing their minds and hearts to the clear word of God because it is correcting some dear dogmas they have held for generations. Are you a true disciple of Jesus Christ or just an Ismite? I am challenging you to face this issue squarely and let the inspired word of God have its proper place in your life. End quote. To be fair to Bullen, I believe he has made more fundamental changes to his worldview than I have to mine, and those changes have been sincere. But to expect him to change his opinion on this subject is like expecting me to change my views on some things. It is not likely. I am not offering to match his $1,000 offer, but if I were, I believe my money would be safe. What I see is not a man who is so diligent in search for truth that he is even offering money to help in attaining that goal, but a man who is so confident that he is already in possession of truth that he is proclaiming his sureness. That's okay. I'm not criticizing Bullen's close-mindedness. In that way, I am like him. My own views of how the exact details of non-resistance should look in our daily lives are open to be influenced. But the basic principles are not. For me to accept the belief in just war would require such a huge leap in logic that I would basically need to embrace a different Jesus, an altogether different gospel. What Jesus and Gospel did Abraham have? I have no interest in that and am willing to engage in the discussion only as an attempt to help others better understand. On subjects like these, I make no claims to, op to open-mindedness. Because of that, we need to be careful to limit our discussions of this nature and not allow them to become emotionally charged. We need to see these as opportunities to contend for the faith, but not imagine that we ourselves should be coming into the discussion with a willingness to be persuaded. I am not. Signed, Aaron Stoll. This was the exact position of the Jewish community in Thessalonica as far as closed-mindedness is concerned. That it was okay to be so. He's, he's charging me with closed-mindedness to justify his closed-mindedness. But I'm the one presenting Scripture, writing books, presenting my case, offering $1,000 for them to show me where it's wrong. Okay? Now, he can misconstrue that into whatever he wants it to be. None of them took me up on my offer. None of them presented uh, 
proof. We were to the end of our discussion, so they had already seen that every point they made fell flat in light of Scripture. Uh, we had been round and around on those things, so they understood, understood that by now. How much Berean nobility can we expect from the youth of this man's community? Will they search the Scriptures or search a book from David Berceau and Dean Taylor? Will they fairly and honestly hear the arguments without prejudice or an unwillingness to hear the truth when presented? Can we expect that from the youth growing up in this, that community in Caneyville? Will they honestly search the Scriptures to see if these things are so or to somehow avoid such conclusions? Will they even honor the Scriptures the Bereans searched, which is the Old Testament? Will they even honor those scriptures above Hippolytus and uh, you know Hermas and all these different early church Antonicene writers? A lot of them were total crackpots. So they don't even honor the scriptures above these early church writings. What do you expect? Will they honor the scriptures above their Antonicene writings? Will they honor the scriptures above their heritage, their name, their people? Although, first generation and second generation Anabaptists, I'm, I'm, I'm using their terminology, because I think Anabaptism was long before they think it started. But with Conrad Griebel and Felix Mance and George Blaurock uh, and, and uh, Balthazar Hubmeyer, those men were first generation. Minnow Simons, I think, would be considered second generation. Michael Sattler would be more first generation. But those men did not agree with these guys. Does that matter? No. No, what will they say? What will they say when they find out their namesake didn't agree with them? Yeah, we don't agree with him and everything. What will they say when, when you try to present to them the truth of the Scriptures and they will say, well, we believe we should follow the voice of the church. I say, no, but the church back then said something different. So you're not following the voice of the original church. That's right. That doesn't matter to them. You know, ultimately, nothing matters. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, look. Look, Paul. Quit trying to turn our world upside down. Quit trying to convince us of something we don't want to believe. Leave us alone and get out of town. Ultimately, that's what it boils down to in spirit, if not in force and action. Now, these people are pacifists, so they're not, they're not going to try and forcefully push you out of town but they won't let your children come to Bible schools and they won't uh, they'll tell their people in the church to burn your books or be excommunicated yeah that you know that all works too and that's happened Aaron said no so what's his children going to say no Living Faith Christian Fellowship are we 100% right on every point We'd like to be. We're trying to be. If somebody shows up with solid scriptural argument for something contrary to how we understand it, what are we going to do? We should continue the same course we've been on. And that same course should be pursuing the truth of God's Word accurately, understanding God's Word better, and growing in the understanding of God's Word, understanding that we have not already attained to perfection in that degree. So, we're not here to defend the faith of Living Faith Christian Fellowship. If we were, then it would be kind of humbling and embarrassing to have to lay that down because somebody corrected us. But if we're here pursuing the truth of Jesus Christ, the truth of God's Word as presented in the Word of God, then that person is not going to be an enemy. They're not going to be a problem. They will be a help. And I'm saying this because I don't know how many generations we will be here at Living Faith Christian Fellowship. At the way, the way the world's going, I think the Lord needs to come back soon. But, I don't know His timetable. But if we get content, if we get satisfied, if we're happy to pick everybody else apart and not pick ourselves apart. You know, I was looking... 
I was thinking about the word hypocrite the other day, and I was thinking, I was guessing the etymology. Hypo, like hypoglycemia, hypoallergenic. It means, you know, a hypothyroid is low thyroid, un an under operating thyroid. Hyper is over operating, right? Hypo. What would crit, what root for that? Maybe critic, critical, critique? So that would mean that this word is a lack of judgment, a, under, a discerning that is under. It also, and that's where it comes from, okay? Hupo, and then the root of the other word is krino. Krino means to judge, or, and hupo is where we get the word hypo. It means under or beneath or lacking, okay? So, the word in the Greek uh, became known, it was used for, for play actors theater people because they acted behind a mask under the guise of something else. So they, they, they were, they were uh, presenting themselves in a different light. So the word hypocrite is like a play actor, okay? But the roots of the words means a lack of judgment or judging yourself by a different standard than you judge others by, okay? Expecting perfection from others but not from me. I can see the mode in your eye, but you can't see the beam in your eye. That's because of under judgment or a judgment that is under a, a lower standard of judgment where you're not being just. You're not judging yourself by the same standard. So, uh, at Living Faith Christian Fellowship, it's a lot more fun to pick everybody apart and show their errors than it is to pick ourselves apart and to grow in grace. I believe the Bereans were a people ready. It tends to readiness of mind. Okay? They searched the Word of God with readiness of mind. Ready for what? To be corrected if necessary. Ready to admit they were wrong if necessary. Ready to be challenged if necessary. Ready to go wherever the truth train was going. Wherever truth was going, they were ready to go. Is that your heart this morning? I hope so. I hope so, because it's all too easy to sink into the Thessalonian bracket. Look, what you're saying is not what I want to believe. What you're saying is inconvenient. What you're saying is not what we've always done. It's not the way we believe. Get out of here. That's the Thessalonian attitude. It's not noble. The Berean attitude is what we need to have. We need to be Bereans. The Bereans were in the habit of searching the Scriptures so they could intelligently discuss them. The Bereans were, were in, in discussing... The more you learn of the Bible, the more you learn you don't know. The more you learn about God, the more you realize there is to learn. That, was, that produces the nobility of the Bereans. The Jews were right that a noble person is only going to be noble when they've given themselves to the study of God's law. Because the more you study God's law, the more you realize the wisdom of God and the ignorance of man. The more you realize the depravity of man and the perfection of God. The more you realize that there is a lot more to learn about this God of ours. And so it leaves you in more of a humble state. Let's stand together. Noble Bereans. There's a lot more to it than just what you may think. If you put yourself in their shoes, somebody they didn't know, never met, shows up and starts correcting their understanding of the Scriptures. How quick will you bristle? Or will we give, hear it out, and search the Scriptures to see if these things are so, not just to defend our previous idea, but there's a lot of things in life. There's issues between husband and wife, fathers and parents and children, brother and brother. There's issues of how do we go about this, how do we do that, where being a Berean is a difference between brotherhood, love and unity and cooperation and chafing and irritation and 
hurt relationships. If we are true Bereans in the matter of our doctrine, we will be true Bereans when it comes to every correction in life. We will be true Bereans when it comes to a person who may want to share with us something that is different than what we thought. Won't we? And, and you know what that makes you? A truly noble person. True nobility. Any thoughts before we go to prayer? It just makes sure you have the foundation of continually searching the scriptures before you have that open mindedness to just anything that comes along because otherwise you'll be swayed by every wind of doctrine. Well, you will be if, number one, you don't know the scriptures very well. If you're not in the habit of studying them, you're not going to study them. And if you're not in the habit of studying them, you're going to be ignorant of them. And yeah, people who, people who are in the habit of wanting to be noble but not willing to do what it takes to be noble, yeah, yeah they're, they're going to follow every wind of doctrine. I've, you know, and, and it's all going to be, suddenly they see things differently. And God has showed them so much. Well, what scripture? I don't. No, no, we're following the spirit. <laughs> don't bring the word of God into it. We're following the spirit. Yeah, you're following your belly. Paul said, "Whose God is their belly?" So yeah, if we are a people like the Bereans, we're going to be a people who quote the scripture, who know the scripture, who ponder the scripture, who discuss the scripture. You think that was happening weekly in Thessalonica? No. But in Berea? Yeah. The Thessalonians were probably discussing their pet doctrines. And there's a lot of churches you can go to where they will discuss their pets. And that's it. And if you bring up a question that doesn't fit with their pet, we, we did it one time down at the Bible Chapel. They were going to discuss their pet, eternal security. We showed up and asked questions that didn't fit in their ideas and it really threw a wrench in the whole thing. And I don't think they really appreciated it. They got to arguing with one another and it caused all kinds of problems. But they were glad to discuss their pet as long as everybody there agreed with their pet. Yeah, it's good when everybody involved recognizes the authority of the Word of God and that is the criteria unbiasedly by which everybody is pointing back to. That's where we get. So when somebody shows up they might be a foreigner, but what they're presenting here is something we're totally, we, we right. are, it's, it's totally has um, validity in our mind, it's our, it's our standard of operation here, and they're presenting us our platform, showing us, you know, and we, so I don't care where you came, you're showing me something in here, so whatever's presented in here, we, we're, we don't need to know the person forever. Right. Uh, but, it, but if I didn't like what they were presenting, then you try to attack the person, and oh, he just came out somewhere, and he, well, uh, then you start doing those derailing. But if both people involved have the Word of God as their foundation, it doesn't really matter where you come from or who you are or whatever. If, it doesn't really matter, you know, people might say you can learn from your dog. If, if whatever it is, if it's presenting stuff in here and this is the foundation, then it doesn't really matter where it comes from. You can now look at this verse that you had previously overlooked and uh, figure out if they, these things are so. And if, if this is truly my foundation, then I'm not going to be working for a bad interpretation, a twisting, a resting. Right. But that only proves that it's not my foundation. Oh, I'm quoting. No, no. You, what you're doing is trying to make that verse fit on your foundation, which is your own. If this is the foundation, then you and I both uh, can discuss it and the, the implications, the interpretation, the Greek word, the verb tenses, the context, and we can come to an agreement. We have to. There's no other way around it. Okay? We will come to an agreement when this is the foundation without prejudice. And how nice it would be. A, uh, a former friend from the Mennonite Church stopped by um, was it yesterday? Maybe it was yesterday. And uh, just stopped by to see us. I hadn't seen him in a long time. It happened to be the man who, when I first wrote the first copy of the Divorce and Remarriage book, uh, the Mennonite Church forbid anybody to have it, and he was afraid to read it, but he, he had a copy, and he read it in his pickup truck up behind his barn. And then he came to our house and stood in the living room of our house, not this house, but the one down the road, with tears in his eyes and said, I believe you're right, 
but I can't go this way or I'd lose my family. I know my wife wouldn't follow, but you know, so I feel like a kid with a new toy. I feel like we really have something to offer these people instead of just telling them to split up their homes. And uh, he was a very sincere man, but he realized the uh, implications. And so he, his wife was the minister's sister. Um, so, you know, really nice fellow. I just shared with him that over the years, I've become more solidified. I gave him a little history lesson about Marcian and talked with him some. But uh, you, you may think that, well, all these people, you know, they just love the Lord and they're willing. No, when, when, you, when you cross grain with their doctrine, bad things can happen to you. You can be pushed out, ostracized, slandered, uh, boycotted. You know, it, it, it's, uh, the fangs show a little bit there. And um, this man realized that. That's why he was hiding it behind the barn reading his book. Yeah, that's what, I mean, that's what you would uh, do around here if you were wanting to uh, listen to rock and roll or watch a dirty movie, not study doctor. Right. Yeah. Yep. Man in your house, right? The man in that house. So, I, I, I pity people who, for fear of losing family and friend, continue on with a system where they're not free to search the Scriptures to see if these things are so. Because if others find out, it's going to be bad. Any other thoughts before we close? That was Adam and Eve situation. I'll go with Eve rather than risk losing her friendship. I would, I'd rather lose God's friendship than Eve's friendship. It's like, what? Really? Right now you would, but what about later? Yeah. Let's pray.